The following content may be distressing or upsetting and not suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Crystal never did things in halves. She was like just a very bright person, a very bubbly person. Full on energetic. Um, like cheeky and fun, full of laughs. Yeah. Always trying to make somebody laugh. <laughs> when she walked into a room, you know, you knew she was there. You could hear, hear her annoying voice. <laughs> She, she was such a bogan, but she was also so beautiful and full of heart and make you laugh no matter what you were doing. Go Telstra, 774061. Thank you, SA Ambulance. What's the exact address of the emergency? She just used to do like random stuff, I feel like <laughs> quite unpredictable in a good way in terms of like being a bit of a prankster and just being that like fun, gregarious person. Six five five seven. also wanting other services. Thank you. Police emergency, what is your location? Why didn't you give way? What made you think that you could beat a truck? On Tuesday, the 18-year-old was returning home from spending Easter at the family's holiday shack. We'd like to see our kids bury us, not the adults burying your kids. And I think that's the hardest reality of all this is that we get to bury our children when they should be doing that for us letting us get through to old age she never got to she never got to 20. crystal lost Bud and my wife from uh, from cancer i think crystal knew something we all learned after she died because she had experienced loss so she, yeah, really grabbed everything and was like, let's go, let's do it. We are so lucky to be here when someone as wonderful as her is not. Just really unfair. It was um, the uni break and she wanted to get away from the rat race where she could do her assignments and everything. So she went down to the shack down at Bowie and her main idea was to get down the coast, stay at the house and have no one to annoy her. And uh, after a couple of days, she, she rang me up and said, look, I can't get the internet to work properly. Um, I might come home. So uh, I said, oh, well, you know, by all means. She'd sent me a text saying that she was coming home. And I said, all right, well, just be careful. And at 10 to four, I had a GPS spot that had her at Port Arthur and I'd gone down to, to meet a couple of mates. So we were just having a couple of beers and I said, anyway, I better get going. Crystal will be getting close to, to being home. And and I thought this is a bit odd. By around five o'clock, five past five that she she wasn't home. So I was sitting there and, and I tried calling her and and there was there was no no answer and put the telly on for the news. And I think it was the Channel 7 helicopter was above above the intersection. And, uh, and at that point there, I seen the white Commodore and... A person has died following a shocking crash at Port Wakefield this afternoon. I knew it was her car. And I immediately uh, rang my sister in Canberra and I said, look, I think we're going to get some news and it's not going to be good. I rang Crystal's sister, Pia. She was in Melbourne and I just said, you know, you're going to get some news very shortly and I don't think it's going to be good. I rang Scott up and said, Scott, um, what's happening down there? And Scott just said, oh, I'm not real sure, but we've got a, we've got a pretty bad accident. So Steve and myself have known each other, oh, I would say now for probably around about six or seven years. Um, in a social setting, we both um, are shack owners uh, on the York Peninsula. 
So at that particular time, um, I was posted as the uh, police commander for the York North local service area. And I was a holiday home uh, near Kabawi on the York Peninsula at that time, and we were actually heading home on the Easter Monday. Assuming you know about this collision on the Cup Coast Highway. Telephone call uh, as I was the officer uh, in charge, and I was also on call that weekend, uh, quite late in the afternoon to advise me that um, there had been a, a serious crash. At that point in time, it wasn't made clear to me that it was in fact a fatal crash. Um, but uh, I did have a number of police cars responding and obviously being a long weekend, uh, traffic conditions and also uh, the distances that police have to drive, it does take some time to respond. So uh, that was the initial phone call that I received. And like anything from that point, uh, you then have to wait for your police officers to arrive on scene and actually give you a full appreciation of um, uh, what they've actually come across. When my police had actually uh, arrived at the scene, um, uh, it was quite a hectic scene given the long weekend conditions and the need to um, manage the traffic around the Port Wakefield Road intersection. Um, as you can appreciate, we've got two main very uh, busy intersecting roads there where uh, you know, we have to um, put significant traffic diversions in place to manage uh, any crash, never mind a serious crash. And it wasn't um, probably until um, a good 20 minutes or so after my police had arrived that um, I made another telephone call um, back to the, one of the police officers, one of the sergeants at uh, Kadena was in attendance at that time. And he said, look, superintendent, we have um, someone that's been killed in a car. We don't know anything more at this point in time other than uh, it's a young girl. It was about that time where Steve actually rang me and um, I very clearly remember the phone call. He said, Scotty, it's Steve. And um, he said, oh, I think I've seen uh, my car. Uh, he said, I've seen the Channel 7 helicopter over the top. And he said, that's my car. I know it's my car. Um, can you tell me if Crystal's OK? I said to Scott, I said, look, something's going on. And Scott was pretty good. He said, look, I'll, I'll have someone out there and I'll, and I'll let you know. And Scotty said to Major Crash, you know, get over there. He's seen it on the TV. Get someone in there because he's, you know, he's a mess. Oh, my gut feeling was quite terrible. Um, I, I shared Steve's feelings in the fact that I really did believe it probably was Crystal in that car. But um, I wasn't going to say that to Steve because, again, it would be um, a hunch and I would certainly hate to get that information wrong and tell my mate that um, his daughter had um, been killed in a car crash if in fact we were wrong. I remember receiving a telephone call from Scott Denny. I had known Scott, um, so when I got the call from him, uh, he told me his involvement in it and that uh, he'd received a phone call from his friend and he wanted to check with me if I knew who the deceased was. At that stage, I didn't know. Now, having been a police officer now for 28, 29 years, uh, I have uh, attended more than my fair share of um, crashes that I ever want to think about. Um, they're all bad, but as you can imagine, some worse than others. But when you get the phone call like that, knowing that it's potentially your um, good mate's daughter that is uh, dead in that car, for me that uh, sent quite significant shockwaves through my system. So it was at that point where I had started to ask my police to establish the identity of the driver, which one of my police officers knew. I do remember seeing Crystal and I do remember thinking how young she was. I do remember thinking that and how beautiful she was. Because I had spoken to Scott, it makes it that little bit more uh, personal as such because I know someone that is going to also be affected because the ripple effect of the road trauma is enormous. So we were on our way to Uluru. I was with one of my girlfriends, Amy. Amy was driving and I was sitting in the passenger side and there was a, a big truck in front of us. Like I vividly remember seeing the car that was involved in the accident kind of hesitate. So they were off to one side of me. Um, so I could see them and it looked like they hesitated and they weren't going to go. I remember kind of having this fear that they were going to go. And the truck didn't slow down and then the car went and then the truck still didn't slow down. It happened so quickly but so slowly and then we realised pretty quickly that it wasn't okay and the truck had hit the car. The truck must have hit the, her door 
um, and it was crumpled in from there. I immediately got on the phone to triple zero. And that was a real struggle because we had no idea where we were. I couldn't tell them any landmarks. There was a person with a car and a dog and they had stopped as well. We're in Port Wakefield Road. Port Wakefield Road. Uh, uh, we're in Port Wakefield on the northern side about a kilometre out of town. I think a lady just passed away in a car accident. She's been T-boning her BT Commodore. OK, so just uh, repeat your location for me, Ben, one more time okay, to make so sure. We're one kilometre north of Port Wakefield on the Port Wakefield Road. On the north. So tell me exactly what's happened. A lady's been T-boned in a car. Um, she's passed away. I think she was hit by a truck. OK, so stay on the phone with me, OK? So yep. are you right with the patients now? No, I'm, with, I'm looking at her right now, yeah. And what about the other driver? Um, just the two? Just the truck? truck? Yeah, so he's up the road, obviously, where he hit her. I think she wants to pull down in front of him. OK, stay on the phone, OK? Now, what about the truck driver? Is he completely oh, away? Yeah, he's barely back in the car. He seems OK, but uh, probably in shock. It took some time for, for us to piece it together and for me to actually uh, establish uh, and confirm that it was Crystal. I don't know how many phone calls I had uh, with Steve in between the time it took major crash to actually attend and knock on Steve's front door. Um, it may have been two phone calls, it may have been three, uh, it may have been more, but um, that couple of hour window certainly felt like, um, it certainly felt like a lifetime. In Scott's defence, I'm pretty sure Scott knew what was, what happened. And after major crash had called in and seen me, then Scott rang me and he said, I, I couldn't tell you, Steve. He said, I couldn't tell a mate that that his, uh, that his daughter was killed in a car accident. I just felt sorry for them because it was the beginning of a horrendous journey for them. I'd like to think I'm a reasonably hardened police officer, but uh, we're not bulletproof. We're human as well. And I can go through some very horrific things in my career, as a lot of police officers have and most of which I pulled through very well. And I guess I'm fortunate like that, that I am a pretty resilient sort of a person, but that was a major turning point in my career that made me think that um, just because we put this uniform on and come to work every day, we're not in fact superheroes and we're not bulletproof. I'd hate to be doing their job because it's not just seeing, telling the person that something's happened, but them also being out there and, and seeing the trauma like an ambulance officer. There were reports that there was a death at the scene, so that's your first indication that something's not right. And then first crew that arrived had three people on it, I think, and the third crew member was a recruit, and I heard his voice on the radio. Four way to one seven two. And it was the inflection and the tone in the voice that made me go, this isn't going to be a good ending. Driver's on scene, being treated for shock at the moment. Uh, Stats have confirmed this female is 116. He sounded devastated and... That made me think I needed to be there. Um, I was about 18 k's away, so uh, from the scene, from what I remember, um, and that 18 k's felt like it took a lifetime. I remember feeling really distressed by seeing them because they looked really young. Uh, set it down, hurt in there. Roger, thanks. Seeing them arrive and just feeling even more upset at the situation these people had to kind of be the first responders to something that looked really, really awful. Uh, I'll leave it with you. Let me know what you need. I had a look at the car first and, and checked and uh, saw that there were no signs of life. As a paramedic, I've, I've approached many, many accident scenes and uh, I think the one thing that stood out to me with this one is the impact point. That might sound really gory, but it was the impact point where I've gone... I'm not, I could never understand how that the truck fitted in the space where the car, like between the two wheels of the car, if that makes sense. Uh, it, other scenes I've been to, it's been a, a front on collision or a front side collision or a rear side collision, never smack bang. So there was a, a fairly significant impact into the vehicle. It looked to be a young person. I could guess the gender based on her hair. Everyone else at that scene was a volunteer and I needed to make sure that they were comfortable with the job in itself, but also comfortable with the job of taking the truck driver through to hospital. He was definitely in shock 
confusion more than anything. He wasn't um, injured as such. It was just a, we wanted to get him through to get him checked out. Um, it's a pretty horrific thing to go through, and I'm pretty sure he saw it all. Do you want to get the bus driver or check on him? Yeah, go check on him. Yeah, I'm just going to talk to him right yeah, now. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks, Ben. Hey, mate, I've got emergency services. You, you okay? You all right, mate? So, uh, Ben. Yep. No, he's here with me now. You okay? Yeah, any of his injuries from him? He's a bit shaken. A bit shaken? Yeah, yep. Hey, cut the fuck safe. You're, you're good, no. No, he's okay. He's, he's shaken. Okay, so let's stay on the phone. Troy was an employee of Mills Freight Lines at Brinkworth, had been working for us for about 10 months. He was very dedicated, um, witty, dry, absolutely brilliant, conscientious. Yeah, he did his job very well. He actually come uh, from a concrete business. He had his own concrete business and he wanted to fulfil his dream of driving trucks because that's what his dad did. We have a very high standard of, of drivers. No, he was very, very good. I remember the day so very well. I was sitting not at my desk, at another desk in my office talking to a good friend of mine and my work phone rang and it was Troy. And I answered the phone, hi Troy, how are you going? And he said, Jane, I've had an accident. And I asked him where he was and he said he was at Crash Corner at Port Wakefield. I then asked him if he was okay. He said, yes. And I said, is there anyone else involved? He said, yes, a car. And I said to Troy, you need to go to the car and see how many people are in the car so I can get help to you. Because obviously an ambulance only takes one person today. And he went to the car and the young lady must have looked up at him and he just said to me, oh Jane, she's just looked up at me, I think I've killed her. So for him to see that and to receive that call, it's tough. I almost feel guilty because I made him go and go to the car, but I needed to get help. Police emergency, what is your location? I have a truck, Mills Freight Lines had an accident with a car at Port Wakefield at Crash Corner. Yeah, I rang triple zero straight away and grabbed my gear, obviously, and got in my car and headed straight for Port Wakefield. I still can't remember if it was me or Amy, and we were like, do we need to go check on that person in the car? And I, can't, I still can't remember who kind of made the final call of, oh, no, we can't go over there. Like, it's, we, we can't, we can't help and we can't like traumatize ourselves by going over there. So we kind of stood in this weird triangle where the truck driver was at one kind of end, we were watching him and we were watching the car that had been in the accident and kind of stood poised, waiting for something to do to help. We were pretty certain that she hadn't survived. When I got to him, he was sitting in the ambulance and um, yeah, the police weren't going to let me through at first and I had to say, look, that's my that's my truck, that's my driver up there, I need to get to my driver. And I got to him and he was sitting in the ambulance and he was just white. Yeah, he was deeply in shock. They took Troy through to the Balaclava Hospital to get checked out um, and I just sat in the waiting room and then they took him back to the scene again to do the interview. I spoke to the truck driver briefly, but then um, was never given the opportunity to speak to him and get a full statement from him because he actually passed away himself. Not related. He was allowed to come with me once I'd finished the interview. Unfortunately, I didn't get Troy home. There was a, um, between Blythe and Balaclava, there was a, a truck, a V-double truck, coming the opposite direction, coming from the north, laden with high density hay bales and um, the load had become unrestrained and six 700 kilo bales come off and come through the front windscreen of my car. It sent us out behind the truck through a fence out into a paddock so eventually the car stopped and I just woke up screaming obviously for help knowing not knowing what the hell had happened. I had multiple fractured ribs Concussion, dislocated elbow, dislocated shoulder and a cracked sternum when I was airlifted to town. That was 
that was the last time I saw Troy. Unfortunately, he was unwell and being unwell and probably the combination of the stress um, of the accidents um, probably made his unwellness escalate and he passed away. My heart bleeds for the young girl's family. Um, obviously, having children of our own, um, that is always my biggest fear of having that knock on the door. So for her family, for Troy's family, the trauma of, first of all, his accident and then the next accident, yeah, my, my heart just bleeds for both losing a loved one is, is cruel. So young, so uh, so much life in front of them. I remember a thought that I had uh, in the in the car, um, and I noticed some uh, medical books. And I remember thinking, "Geez, this is an 18-year-old that's going into a medical profession." I remember thinking, "Wow, she had so much life in front of her, and just starting uni—that's the best time of her life." She wanted to save people. That was that was her thing with with nursing. Her feelings were, "If I can do something to help." she'll be there to help. So we're starting our degree together and she wanted to do it because of what she saw when her mum had cancer. It was really hard, I think, afterwards to not see her there and not have that, yeah, crystal-shaped hole went through the rest of our degree, I think. It's a shame, isn't it? Her friends are out there. Three or four of the girls now have finished, finished their nursing. Now they've got their whole life to look forward to and a, and a great career, you know, because they're in nursing. I, I went into the hospital there um, a couple of years ago, I suppose, and, and in the lift was, was one of the girls. You felt completely selfish that you got to do things that she wasn't. And I still feel that, like, sometimes you feel like you're giving yourself because she doesn't get to. It was such a young age where you were just learning about driving anyway. You didn't know, yeah, people spoke about accidents and that that happened, but you don't think it's you or going to be your friend. But yeah, it does. You don't take those risks. You don't think it's a joke. I see a truck and my whole body goes into like a shock of like, this could kill me. That was pretty uh, obvious what had happened. We also knew that there was dash cam as well from the truck, so we had a pretty clear indication of what had happened from the beginning. Crystal had approached the intersection from Copper Coast Highway, uh, approaching Augusta Highway, and intending to turn right. Um, however, she's failed to give way to an oncoming truck and, uh, and collided with it on her driver's side. There was um, very good signage in terms of the approaching intersection. We will never know why she hasn't seen that, uh, why she hasn't seen the flashing lights. Um, and I believe it wasn't her first time having driven through there as well. So that's something like with many crashes that we never can know the full answers because the only person that knows the answer has passed away. Could we have done anything, uh, anything different there? Um, I, I really don't think so from a policing perspective. Um, and the police, major crash, are very good at what they do. Um, it doesn't make their job any easier. Um, they just get better at what they do, and they do a fantastic job. Um, but just to get that uh, knock on the door, I really would have liked to have been living next door to Steve to be able to knock on the door myself and tell him. I think it was seven o'clock, major crash, come around and knocked on the door, and she gave us a cuddle, and, and uh, I think I went to the fridge and grabbed myself a cold, cold beer, and shook like, like a leaf in the wind. I do remember thinking he was such a lovely man and his whole life was destroyed. It's really difficult and you can prepare in your head what you think you're going to say, but I can guarantee you from experience the words just come out and sometimes you don't even have to say the words. People know that something's wrong, so how do I keep it together? I keep it together as best I can because I just remind myself this is not about you, Kirsten. It's not about you and that's what I actually say to myself. I've seen all sorts of things. Uh, anger, disbelief obviously, and uh, emotion immediately. I suppose for me, I just think 
I don't have to fill the room with words. So sometimes we might not say anything, but I try to pick up on when it's my time to leave as well. And I try to really pick up on what they might need at that time. Some people want all the information that you've got. Some people want no information at all. It probably affects me differently if I can associate with that person. So perhaps if it's a child of the same age as mine, that's when I will be affected by it more. Or if someone um, is the same age as my mum or my sisters, that's when it would affect me more if I can actually associate with it personally. We all uh, have the ability to disassociate ourselves as well. And that's not to be cruel, but it's to be professional and look after our own well-being, but also be able to deliver what the family wants and the family wants answers. And if I get too emotional, I'm not going to be able to do that for them. The reason I joined Major Crash was because my dad died in a crash uh, when I was two. I don't think that she received a lot of support at the time and that was really important to me to then go into that line of work myself. So if I could give someone just one little bit more than my mum got, then that's what was going to make me satisfied in my job. And I did turn around to Major Crash and I said, just tell me she wasn't on the phone at the time. And they go, nah. The only thing that was running on a phone was the GPS. I said, yeah. They were with me for what seemed like an eternity, but they were there to, to calm me down. And, and then when they, they left, I rang, I rang a couple of mates up and I said, yeah, you better come round. I said, we got some terrible news. Yeah, that's really like intense. Yeah, I was at work and my mum came to tell me. And I think like, yeah, those sorts of situations, like being so young, um, just disbelief, like complete disbelief, complete shock. Mm. I remember like vomiting afterwards, like the shock of finding out that. Crystal's ex-boyfriend called me and then I just hung up the phone and immediately called Jade. I didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I was in bed, I was asleep, and I got a phone call from Mirren. We called Izzy and I can just still hear Izzy literally just scream like she didn't say anything. I was scrolling on Facebook and I just, I didn't want to believe that. I think even now, Sometimes I forget because I like to think it's not real. Like we were so young, like fresh out of school, like we had our whole lives ahead of us. I think to experience something like that is really, really hard. Your friend who's your age and full of life, like die in a car crash, it just didn't seem real mm. at all. Yeah, I think the helplessness was the hardest part afterwards what will stick with me for the rest of my life is um, the sheer nature of that grief that we were all experiencing and I guess the way that it just grips the body um, beyond belief. It's like the best time, you know, that's what you look forward to, like year 12, growing up, going to uni, experiencing all these things. The sadness of, well, she's not here to get to experience this. Why her? Mm -hmm. Why not me? Why not any of us? Like why, for what reason yeah. did that have to happen? It didn't have to happen, it did, but it did. And then having to accept that and then move forward and make choices about our lives that she didn't get the opportunity to make, that really hurts. It really didn't sink in and probably until very later that night when you've settled down and then you realise that she isn't coming home. And that's, that's the hard part. That really is the hard part. I actually never knew Crystal, um, but through my close relationship with Steve, and Steve and myself are, are very close friends, um, I think it's safe to say that um, I probably did actually feel like I knew Crystal very well. Um, Steve, very, very close with his family, both of his daughters. I felt I had to had to be strong around Pia 
So it was like, pick yourself up, let's get through this. Pia's got a lot of anxiety, depression. It's probably hit Pia worse than me in the respect that she lost the mother at a, at, at a very young age. I lost the wife um, and then she lost the sister, you know, and they were, they were very close. Was, you do miss the arguments in the house. <laughs> Crystal was forever, you know, into, into Pia because Pia would be pinching Crystal stuff. So and I used to turn around to Crystal and I said, well, take some of hers. And she said, I won't fit into it. <laughs> the funeral was so tough having to plan what to say to these people and trying to keep it together. I remember standing up, having this like casket in front of us. And I just remember looking out and it felt so surreal that there were so many people there and they were all there for Crystal because they were all feeling a part of what all of us were feeling. And I just think we'll always remember that. I just remember staring at the coffin because I just didn't think that she was actually in there. <laughs> it was just incredibly hard. That will stick with me um, for as long as I'll see this career out and I've got a few years in this career left. Quite a few uh, fatal crashes that I've had to personally attend um, in the country uh, over my years and you have either known the person um, you've known them through your kids' um, football clubs and sporting clubs because they've been young drivers that have been killed in cars. It's been the parents um, of other children that you know, or in fact, it's been other parents in the community that you know through work or, or social context. So it's very real, and I guess that's the um, uh, uniqueness about country policing. I've had uh, uh, Terry Williams lost a daughter in that, in that section, and Trevor Stoker's son, Rick Stoker lost a son probably about 18 months ago. The three of us, we've all lost children in, in that vicinity. It's, it's, it is a case now, whenever you kind of go to drive somewhere, um, everyone says, drive safely. We want to see you back. So I, I think a lot of people have turned around and thought, it's not just a case of getting into a car. You've got to be prepared for anything. So. Nothing prepares you for losing a daughter or a relative or a mum, a dad. The trucks today are big on the road. Respect them, just respect them. I can't um, stress that enough. They're big, they carry big weight. Um, they can't pull up in seconds. We've always said share the road and share the road responsibly, but before you get in that car, make the conscious choice of what you're going to do. A lot of it can just purely be inexperience. Uh, not driving to conditions, distraction. Um, I don't think people deliberately get in a car with a view of um, thinking this is how my day is going to end. I often drive country roads and I see how easy it is to do something stupid or not paying attention, like what that can do, and that still scares me. It's decisions that people make in cars at that time. One split second decision is the matter of your life or someone else's life or getting to the end point of where you need to be. It scares me so much when people overtake me when they shouldn't be. It brings me back and it's like I've lost someone so close to me. Don't be that person that doesn't make it to the other end. People are complacent because they've not been through it. Don't be that person that's responsible for harming or killing someone else on a road and then having to go through the rest of your life knowing that one silly decision on that road could have very much been avoided. Perhaps they haven't experienced the lifelong effects of road trauma. Like an extra five minutes isn't gonna hurt. It still really infuriates me now when people are on the road and like they're driving like, you know, they're invincible or <laughs> there's not millions of other lives on the road. Like you're gonna affect so many people by making those wrong decisions, thinking you're invincible. Not a day goes by when you don't think about her and it's not even necessarily sad anymore. It's just that she's there. She'll always be here. Um, the girls from, from St. Aloysius School, you know, they, they stay on, on Facebook and little things come up there and yeah.
crummy. I love crummy. I love crummy. I don't know about everyone else, but I find it hard to, I guess, swallow the term accept it. I think we've had so, like, we still have a lot of questions. Um, there's a lot of things left unanswered that may never be answered. Yeah, I guess it's about keeping her memory alive. She was a good friend and I guess at the end of the day, she taught me like so much and I am so grateful for her life and for her friendship because I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for her. There's something that I just wish I'd done differently or said differently. I think at the time, Kristen was really leaning on me and Jade and she was at our house every day and I just wish I gave more time. Or every day something happens and someone I wanted to meet. Or We've just learnt to celebrate her life now and, yeah, we're so lucky to know her. They made up a, a cross with, with a heap of, like a tribute flowers and all that. And we brought that back and we planted it on the side of the road and I go down to Kabawi, you know, once a week, once a fortnight. So I've got to go past that site every time I go there. You kind of feel like you just want to slow down that little bit and you think about what happened with Crystal. You see the roadside markers on the side of the road and they are a constant reminder of, of each and every job. I hope they're a constant reminder for the public that see them as well, because uh, I know they are for just about every paramedic. And that's someone that's not going to go home. That's someone that's missing a son or daughter, a mother or a father, uh, a relative. Um, everyone knows someone out there. When I'm driving and I see a roadside marker or uh, a memorial, sometimes I can actually remember that specific crash because I might have been involved with it. So it always takes me back to that point. And also I find if I'm even driving through the same area myself when I'm not working and I'm approaching a, a place where I attended a crash, it does actually make me feel a little bit nervous because I think about what happened. And if that happened for me, could I avoid that situation? I've always thought, you know, there's, there's a loss of life, no, no reason. You know, that's, it's such a shame that someone's lost their life in a motor vehicle accident. He didn't want Crystal to die in vain. Like he wanted it to be a catalyst for change. And, you know, the Port Wakefield um, turn off, like that's all changed. There's been so much development there, I think. It's, it's so awful like that that happened, like there's no words for that, but it's good to see that they've made a change. When you're 18, I think you feel invincible, but you're not, you know, life is so precious. And sometimes it takes these heartbreaking things to, you know, put that into perspective. She's missed out on, on a great life for one second of inattention.